Welcome back to Mondays with Mover. It's Monday. I'm Mover C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. If you're looking for a book for your quarantine reading, the Spectre series box set is only 99 cents for this month. It's a terrorism, espionage, military thriller with F-16s. And if you get to the uh, Finney Flight, which is the most recent book, it's got some flankers in it, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, also, I'm working on the Alex Shepard, I think it's book three now. I don't know if you'd really count uh, Helios as the second book in that series, but I'm working on that. Uh, if you're looking for a military, more of a military police terrorism thriller, uh, Alex Shepard is your choice, and it's first person. It's the only book I write that's actually written in first person. So anyway, today we're going to talk about how fighters fly in the weather. So how we get... Uh, to the airspace or to the fight or to whatever we're doing and then how we get home. A lot of people have asked that, like, do we do formation takeoffs normally or whatever? So uh, as singletons or as a section or two ship or division, which is a four ship, how do we get where we're going and back when the weather is less than ideal? So uh, a couple things, the Air Force and the Navy do things slightly differently. So I'm going to try to talk to both, even though sometimes it can get a little confusing. So, so when the weather gets bad, there are a couple ways that we can get to the airspace if it's training or to the fight if it's not. So I'll, I'll talk about those. Uh, first off, we just go as singletons. We go as single ship and I'll meet you in the airspace. That is not typically desired, but it is a possibility, especially if radars are broken or someone doesn't have currency and formation takeoff or whatever. So that's, that's kind of your, hey, I'll just meet you in the airspace. We'll set up a point, we'll set up an altitude, we'll have altitude deconfliction, and we'll, we'll work on a rejoin or rendezvous there. The second one is a formation takeoff. And a formation takeoff is something we practice. It's something you have currency in. The Air Force does it a lot more than the Navy, um, at least in my experience. And formation takeoff is basically you put two aircraft on the runway. We never do it in more than two aircraft. And there are restrictions, like you can't have standing water on the runway. The crosswind can't be uh, above a certain limit. The, the reason for that is because you're basically putting two aircraft right next to each other and you're taking off together. So the way it typically works is you get there, you give the, the head sig uh, you give the head nod, uh, a run up signal, and then when the flight lead, he's going to tap his head. When his chin hits his chest, he's going to release the brakes, go to whatever power setting. Uh, so like an F-16, you can do them in mill power or afterburner. In T-38, we always do them in afterburner because you can't really take off in mill power, uh, military power. So <clears throat> you do the takeoff and then you rotate together. Uh, you're you're kind of far out. And a lot of the videos that you've seen, people complain, well, they look so far away. That's because it's a fisheye lens. We're actually, you know, you're separated by the center line because the reason you want to be separated by the center line is if the one aircraft has to abort for whatever reason, you don't want to be right next to each other and clip wings and go spinning off the runway. So we'll use the center line as a brick wall. If one's aborting, the other one can just take off or they can sympathetic abort or something like that. So you'll do a formation takeoff. And then once they're cleaned up, the gear and the flaps are up, move into a fingertip position, fly through the weather in fingertip. And then once out of the clouds, which you know, depends on how bad the weather is. I mean, I've had some sorties where I've spent, you know, 30 minutes in fingertip, which can be kind of fatiguing because you're in close formation that entire time in the weather. And you kind of get spatially disoriented because you're in the clouds and you're like, I don't know which way is up or down. I'm just looking at this guy's wing. So and, and we can fly all the way through the weather. If for whatever reason you lose sight, then it's called lost wingman. So it's procedures that we have. Uh, whether you're in a turn, you're straight ahead, you know, 15 degrees for 15 seconds, something like that is w what procedure you do. But typically, it, you usually just stay together. That's formation takeoffs. And believe it or not, we don't do them that often. It's not, not, not the, the primary method, except for like a T-38, which doesn't have a radar. The next one is an instrument trail departure, which also doesn't rely on a radar. And that is one aircraft takes an interval behind the other. So typically, good weather day, you do between 10 and 15 second interval takeoff. So one aircraft will take off and then 10 to 15 seconds later, the second one will take off. 
in a radar or sorry an instrument trail you, you back that up to like a 15 to 20 second interval because now you are you're maintaining a distance behind the other aircraft and then he's calling all turns he's setting a power setting so like the f-16 it's called f tit uh, or the uh, egt or whatever aircraft you set a power setting and you basically hold that you call all turns you call all altitudes passing for 5,000 feet or so and then once visual you call the visual and you go if the radar is working we'll do a radar trail radar assisted trail uh, departure so now you're, you're taking off and it's an instrument trail up until the point that they call tide or in the navy tide on and once he calls tide you're just using the radar lock you don't put you don't put them in the HUD because you know you don't want to run into them. But you're using the radar to um, st maintain that mile and a half to two miles and following them around until you're out of the weather. Then you call visual and then he'll clear you for the rejoin. Uh, if you remember from my lightning strike video, uh, I never called visual because I knew we were going through the weather and my flight lead said, "Hey, you going to get on board or not?" cuz he knew we weren't in the weather. So that's when I rejoined uh, to fingertip. But that was a radar trail departure. So we did radar trail up to the point that he said, "Hey, you going to get on board?" and then I went to fingertip. There's also sensor trail is the exact same thing except instead of using the radar, you're using um, your data link. So we have data link tying each other together and we use that to maintain our, our spacing so we don't run into each other. And that's pretty much it to get out to the airspace, um, you know, through the weather or whatever. It's much more comfortable to do a radar trail. There are some downsides is now you don't have your radar open to sweep for threats or other stuff. But in peacetime, that's not a big deal. In combat, obviously, it's a lot bigger deal. So a sensor trail might make more sense. Um, formation, I mean, it's good, especially if you've got a bunch of aircraft you're trying to get airborne. You know, you keep them together. You're not, because you'll spread them out. You'll be at that mile and a half to two miles, and that's over and over and over and over. So you'll end up with a four ship that's, you know, six miles apart or something like that. So you'll have big distances between aircraft so it's maybe not the best if you're doing a large force exercise or something like that in the airspace obviously we don't have weather radar a lot of them now uh, we fly with uh, like in the t-38 we fly with the adsb pucks that have xm uh, well actually that adsb actually has its own uh, radar that it pumps through the adsb system and we put it on our ipads uh, we also fly with with Garmin's that have XM weather antennas that we can look at for weather. You can put a radar, uh, a me mechanically scanned radar, in a ground map mode and roll it up, and you can actually get you can paint uh, if it's real heavy sails or something. It's not all that reliable. And then some of the fifth gen fighters actually have the ability uh, to do that. But again, it's fighter radars are not very good at finding weather. We do not rely on them to find thunderstorms and stuff. We just basically see and avoid. And if ATC tells us there's a storm, we try to deviate as necessary to get around it uh, but in the going through the weather we'll transit weather stuff like that it'll just be hey you're in a tack line abreast uh, wing rock you'll rock them in and go to a, um, a fingertip position or you can just use the data link if you're far enough apart you can just use the data link to make sure you're both on the same heading and stuff it's not an official thing that's more of a technique but using the data link to punch your some thin layers of weather is something that sometimes happens. Coming back home, that's where, you know, that's where you're gonna make your money. Um, now, I'll talk about the Navy first, because I think this is probably the biggest travesty. They fixed it with Fat Amy in the F-35, but in the Hornet community, for the longest time, we could only do, I'm talking shore base. Now, at the boat, you pretty much have ICL, ICLS, which is an ILS for the ship, and ACLS, which is a data link director for flying approaches on the ship. That's at the ship. Shore-based, however, ICLS does not work. In fact, it only works unofficially because there's no published approaches at, I think, two fields, Lemoor and uh, Oceana, although I'm not sure on that one. But the reason for that is it's based on a TACAN. So the TACAN channel is different than a civilian ILS. A civilian ILS is a VHF frequency. So. Uh, the Blue Angels have civilian ILSs because they do mostly civilian stuff. But most tactical F-18s, the only approaches you can fly are uh, non-precision approaches, uh, TAC ANTs. So uh, to fly a precision approach, you have to use what's called a PAR, um, which is using a radar and a ground controller. It basically tells you if you're on glide path, 
uh, and you're on, you're within the localizer limits. Well, it's not localizer limits, you're with azimuth limits for the approach. So there's ASR and PAR, those are surveillance approaches. You have to have a ground controller do it, it has to be working, and they have to have that surveillance radar to talk you in, essentially. Um, which limits you because you can't, when we take off, we have to have minimums, right? Well, you have to use what's on board to go fly it. So whereas a PAR might take you down to 300 feet, a TACAN can only take you to 550, 500 to 600 feet or so. So that limits when you can take off when you're shore based. In general, for both the Air Force and the Navy, we fly a precision approach and non-precision approach. I know the airlines call it an ILS and a non-ILS, and that's because in the airline world, you can make a non-ILS look like an ILS because you've got the uh, the flight directors and you put a glide path in and it'll take a, a, a TAC-IN approach, well, it's not a TAC-IN, a VOR approach or something like that and make it look like um, a uh, an ILS. When we fly them in the TAC-IN, we basically typically do the drive and dive. So you go down to, you know, you have your step down fixes, you go down to whatever the minimums are and you drive you know 10 feet above minimums so you don't bust through the minimums at 550 feet until you reach your visual descent point and you either hey i see the runway or i don't and i go around so um, a little different in the military world than the civilian obviously ils we fly like an ils so navy world all you have is a tack in and uh, PAR ASR. So if if you end up in a situation where you had to divert, which I have before, where you know New Orleans NASGRB New Orleans has a problem, and I had to go to MSY, which is New Orleans International, there's no approach available because uh, their ASR they withdrew and didn't tell anybody, and then now um, they don't have anything. I mean, I can't fly a civilian ILS, and I can't fly a civilian localizer. And at the time we could not fly RNAVs. Now I, I'm told now the super Hornets and the Hornets have RNAV capability. So that's added that, but it's still a non-precision approach. It's not, there is no precision pr approach capability that I'm aware of yet. So things change, but as of right now, uh, that's not how it works. On the Air Force side, they do have ILSs. So all the aircraft are equipped with civilian ILSs because we don't go to the aircraft carrier, so we don't need to worry about the boat. Um, so you have the ILS capability. You can fly it as an ILS, you can fly it as a localizer, or you can fly it, uh, fly a tack and approach. And it's the same thing. You know, if you're flying an ILS, you use the flight director. And if you're flying uh, non-ILS or a non-precision approach, you drive down, do the step down stuff. That's single ship. Now, when you're in a formation, there are a couple ways to do it. One way is just get separate clearances. So when you're checking out with ATC, you go, hey, uh, Mako 1-1 will be uh, single, Mako 1-2 only on his own separate clearance, and you'll just split off and you know go fly your own ILSs. If you are coming back together, you can come back and do a formation approach. We don't typically do formation landings. In fact, I think the only ones that do formation landings anymore are pilot training, because I think in the fighter community, formation landings just don't happen anymore. But so the way it typically work on the Air Force side is a formation approach. And either at two miles, they will have one aircraft drag. So once you're visual with the field, uh, one aircraft, uh, he'll call visual, and then he'll direct the other one to drag. And at that point, the lead aircraft will maintain whatever speed he was at, like let's say 180 knots, and the other aircraft will slow to final. And then once he calls saddled, okay, now we're in a good position. We've got our spacing, and then they can go ahead and land sequentially. Uh, if you remember from my video with the missile shoot, that's exactly what we did. I flew in formation with him uh, until we were both visual to field, and then he called drag. So I started taking spacing using speed brakes. And then once I was in position, I called um, saddle. The only difference in that video is I ended up having to go around because uh, there was another aircraft in the way and I didn't have spacing. So luckily the weather was good enough and I can land. If the weather had not been good enough, I'd had to go all the way back around in the radar pattern. So that's formation approach. Most of the time though, if you can, a radar trail is better. The only problem with that is you end up getting strung out. You know, like I said, you'll get real, real you know, that's six miles and sometimes um, some locations don't like that. So you'll use the radar to keep sight of each other and watch the turns and time your turns so that you stay in that, uh, you know, two to three miles. And we can do that with sensor too. You'll be in a sensor trail as long as everything's working, it's fine. So either a formation or a sensor or a radar or just pick up your own clearance. And that's how we come back. We used to do formation landings. 
but I mean, again, it, it's kind of a risk versus reward thing. It's just not done as much. One thing you can do is you can do a formation approach and then drop the other aircraft off in the flare. So you go all the way down and the lead aircraft, you know, we've got clearance to land. He'll go around or she and the aircraft that's usually with a problem of some sort will land and then that second aircraft, first aircraft will go around uh, and land on their own. But usually that's something, something's going wrong. So that's how we get to and from the airspace and come back. Uh, I know it's kind of complicated, but it really isn't. It just, it all depends. I mean, it's based on the situation, it's based on what's going on. It's, it's not really a one size fits all stuff, but uh, we don't have the ability like a, um, you know, like a 737 to fly like a Cat 2 or a Cat 3 ILS. So whatever the minimums are, usually minimums are determined in the Air Force by experience. Uh, so, you know, if you're a new guy, new to the airplane, you're 700 feet and two, uh, 500 a mile and a half or 301. And then by OG waiver, you can go down all the way to minimum. So typically though, in a fighter, you just don't want to. And then it's just our approach speeds are faster. We just don't have the equipment like a 737 or an Airbus or something like that. Although we do have HUDs and we do have flight directors in the HUD and it is fairly good. It's just not like coupling uh, autopilot. And you know, some of the hardest flying I've ever done has been single pilot in the T-38 IFR because you're flying around at 300 knots. You don't have an autopilot, it's just trim and you're using um, steam gauges from 1955. So it can definitely be a challenge, but it makes you a better pilot, I think. But obviously in the modern aircraft, you're just looking at the HUD and looking at the MFDs and stuff like that, but they can present their own challenges. It's not that easy, but it's definitely something that, you know, when, when the weather is good, it's good to go out and practice and just be familiar and get comfortable with it. And when the weather's bad, if flying is canceled for something, it's good to go out and actually do real approaches and log some instrument time and get, get some practice like that. So if you watch, uh, the approach video here, um, it is me at a tack end. The tack end approach is actually off centered from the runway. So I'll break out and then see the runway and then obviously be at an angle to the runway and have to deviate to make that work. So that's why that video I, I posted a little bit earlier in this video, that's what that was, is just that jink because not, they're not always, you know, down the runway. Sometimes they're off centered based on obstacles or terrain or something like that. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you're looking for a charity to support Folds of Honor is the one I recommend. Also, if you need a shirt like this, go to the uh, Snack Bros uh, Teespring store. You can pick up a shirt like this and don't forget the Spectre Series box set is available for uh, 99 cents. Also, uh, if you want to watch me do gaming stuff, iRacing, maybe DCS, Grand Theft Auto, LSPDFR, all that stuff, twitch.tv slash movermedia tomorrow night uh, at I think it's 7 p or 8 p.m. Eastern. We will be doing the uh, second race in the Mover Cup I Racing League. It's a road race. Uh, last night was a lot of fun. I wrecked at the last couple minutes. Three laps to go, I got wrecked. So I almost won it, but is what it is. It's a racing incident, but it's a lot of fun. Hope you'll join me. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. I will see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Oh! I've a lot of them. Usually fly with the door off. Don't be a douche. Rule number one. I can tell you now.